celebrating 10 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Thomas Zachariah. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill, and these are great stories about great people who prove with their lives that anything is possible. My guest today is Thomas Zachariah. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much, Halloran. I'm excited to have you here because I really do love engineers. Uh, I was telling you before we started that my brother-in-law, Michael Harris, is an engineer, and he's a professor at Purdue, and he's a friend, a model, and a mentor. And the thing I love about engineers is, and you acknowledge this, they're problem solvers. Yeah, they're looking yeah. for problems to solve. That's that's their uh, stock and trade, if you will. So I'm excited to have you here because deep down inside, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek, and I love being around great brains. So thanks for bringing your brain here. Thank Where you. does your life start? Well, my, my, my life started in, in Kerala, in India. In the southern Where is part Kerala? Of Kerala is in the southern part of India. It's a, it's a lush, green place, much like Tennessee. It's about 200 miles long and 50 miles wide in the widest. And, wow. And it's got, the po it's got the population of Canada. Wow. You know, so it's, a, it, it's really densely populated. So what was life like there? Life was actually very good. I, came, I grew up in a very comfortable uh, family, a comfortable background, and, and you know, education was stressed. And I always thought that uh, I would stay and, you know, stay and live in Kerala until the opportunity to come to the U.S. for higher education opened up the world for me. How did you get that opportunity? Because I understand in India, it is very competitive educationally. I mean, uh, I guess India has over a billion people now. That, that's correct. And when you have over a billion people, just the mathematics of that say, if you have a university and it only has this many slots, only so many people get to go to university, and only so many people get to go abroad. So how do you happen upon, if you happen upon, an opportunity like that? Well, I think I think education is key, and education is stressed. And uh, I think uh, the intensity is quite high. Uh, and like you said, the numbers are such that only the very, very cream of the crop graduate with high honors that allows you to come to, this, uh, to the U.S., and, and God was very fortunate. So I said, I, I thought I would stay and, and you know, start a business or work for my father, who was in business at the time. What did he do? Uh, he was actually in engineering construction, so he built big buildings and bridges and dams and so on. And, and I had this opportunity of, of, you know, of all places to come to Ole Miss. Uh, so I, I came to do master's in engineering in Ole Miss. And it was such a great experience, and I've looked back. All right. Um so what kind of st were you a naturally bright and precocious young man, or did you become, uh, did your IQ change by work, or was it native? Well, I think that, um, you know, uh, what I would say is a little bit of both. Uh, I think, you know, human beings everywhere are smart people, and, and you have extremely bright people on the one hand who don't have to do anything. It comes naturally to them, and, and I would say that I needed to apply myself, you know, and and what and in the early days, uh, you know, I was bright enough that I didn't have to apply myself. But when I came to the U.S., particularly when I came to the laboratory, it really focused my attention. And and I that is when I really started working with a purpose. And and I think uh, it has been a remarkable 25 years in East Tennessee. Did you think your life would work out the way it has worked out? No, not not at all. I, I think it worked out for the better. No question about it. Uh, you know, when when uh, when I came here, I thought I'll finish my uh, um, master's in engineering and I'll go back. Um, I was here about a couple of years, and uh, my accent had sufficiently changed. My my father said, "You're going to come back home and get married," and had a very traditional arranged marriage to my lovely bride, who is my wife now for a long, long time, and. Uh, you know, she is my partner, and she has been supporting me through all the work. You know, all the hard work that we put together, and so she 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 deserves all the credit as well. How did you get the opportunity to come to Oak Ridge? So I after uh, I finished my master's, we got married in, in India, the traditional wedding, and then I asked my wife, hey, you know, 
would you like to go back? And I had an admission for PhD at Clarkson University in upstate New York. And she said, let's just go. You know, it was going to be our extended honeymoon and a PhD. And it was a fabulous, fabulous experience for us. And the first presentation that I made out of my PhD thesis was in this out-of-the-way place that I never heard of called uh, Smoky Mountain, right? Uh, and and so, so I came here to East Tennessee and gave that presentation. And in the audience, it was a, pr a conference organized by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And, and my first boss at Oak Ridge National Laboratory offered me a position to be a postdoc here, said, would you like to be a postdoc at Oak Ridge? And I asked my wife, and we said, why not? You know, it seemed like a good place. The only thing I had known about this place was that the 1984 World's Fair was held here. But, you know, once you come here, it's a great place. The mountains, the lakes, the lush greenery, it's a great place to, you know, raise family. Thomas Zachariah is my guest. You're watching Anything is Possible. The world's fastest supercomputer is right here in East Tennessee, and this guy had a lot to do with it. You'll find out about that story coming up. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. Uh, one has to imagine the possibility and, and really Go for it. it that, that, that truly is the, is the story. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. My guest today is Thomas Zachariah. There's a question for, yeah, I don't, yeah, why not? You, you keep saying, why not? You have an opportunity and you embrace the opportunity. I, I've met you once before, but I don't know that I've ever had an opportunity to have a conversation. And what strikes me about you is you have a great energy about yourself. Um, what is that? Oh, well, I, well, you seem you. happy. I am happy. I, I really do believe that uh, you know you have to embrace the challenges that come at you in a positive way. You know, if you are not willing to take the risks, that then then you'll never achieve anything. And and I don't want to suggest that somehow. Uh, it, the whole reason is to map out your life to achieve something. You have to live in the moment, create opportunities. In my experience, is that it leads to other opportunities, and that gives leads to a much richer life. So you know, you mentioned supercomputing. The way it happened was that I came to Oak Ridge National Laboratory as a material scientist, not to run a supercomputer. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> looking at my notes. And I'm thinking, how does this? So this work? so so it really uh, then then associate lab director. Ed Oliver one day called me. It is a true story. He called me and said, Thomas, we've been trying to hire somebody for a computer science and mathematics division, and we haven't found anybody to take the job. I want you to take the job. And so, so let me let me answer the question. <laughs> uh, why not? Why not? <laughs> Indeed. I said, why not? Sure. I'm, and I was, I'm neither a computer scientist nor a mathematician, other than that, why not? You know, and, and, and I just been, and so I, one day, I wa you know, the next day I walk in, I say that I'm the new guy. And, and uh, it really, uh, the division at the time had about $7 million and about 50 or 60 people. It's a wonderful, wonderful division with rich heritage. Uh, you know, computing was established at the laboratory by Alvin Weinberg and Householder. Back, it dates all the way back to 1947. Wow. And so it has got that rich heritage. And so the mid-'80s, it was not doing as well you know, in the national rankings, and so we were not able to get the kind of people. So when Ed asked me to do this, I said, sure, why not? One of the first things that I had to do was to cut costs, meaning you know, because we had a very conservative uh, uh, budget at the time. So I called the department and said, hey, you know, uh, we are supposed to turn this machine off uh, by the end of the year. Could I turn it off six months earlier? Because that would save $3 million, which I can reinvest. And the department said, sure. We took that $3 million that we saved by shutting down a machine three, six months earlier and parlayed that into within 18 months of first teraflop machine in the Department of Energy Office of Science. And so, you know, again, wait I Wait a think minute. So <laughs> you go in and you figure out, wait a minute, if we turn off the old machine... <laughs> the money we save, we can use to buy it. Am I, is that what I'm hearing? We, you we say? use the money as a seed. We, we, we use the money as a seed, and we got some funding from 
two programs in DOE to bootstrap that. And the next thing you know, we had one of the powerful computers in the world. Uh, this was a Cray? No, this the first machine that we bought uh, was an IBM system. It's an IBM Power 3 system. And, and then we continued that uh, up until 2004. In 2004, you might recall, the Japanese built a billion dollar fastest machine in the world called Earth Simulator. It was a, a Sputnik kind of a moment where th that machine was so much more powerful than anything that we had. And we had a proposal written the next week and presented to the Department of Energy as to say how we can overtake the Japanese. And that led, with a lot of support from a lot of people, to where we are today. There is no question that Oak Ridge National Laboratory today is the preeminent place for supercomputing in the world. In the world. In the world. No question about it. Tell me about Titan. Well, Titan is going to be an incredibly impressive machine. It's going to be 20 petaflops. So 20 petaflops uh, is 20,000 teraflops. Uh, okay. you know? And so just to let you know, in 2004, when we, when we had our first Cray system, it was a three teraflop kind of a machine. Wow. So this is almost 20,000 times faster than, than that, the machi machine. That, that machine that we had in 2004. So it, it opens up the possibility to do remarkable science. But it's not the science alone. There is you know, almost half the, the scientists and engineers of the laboratory have been there less than 10 years. They all came to the laboratory expecting this laboratory to be the preeminent place mm -hmm. in the world. And it's ultimately, it's the people who perpetuate, who make the laboratory, the institutions last for the you know, hundreds of years. So I'm very, very confident that Oak Ridge's future is bright. It's got tremendous talent and people. I'm looking forward to the next chapter. I just, I just sitting here, I just figured out something about you that I didn't realize. Uh, I fully expected that when we had this conversation, it would be maybe one part technical and one part personal. But I f I'm on to something that I want to I want to run by you here in just a moment. Let me let me think on this for just a second because I I just something just stunned me, and I'll I'll ask you about it in the next segment. Um, but as we wrap up this segment. Um, what did you learn in that process of building the preeminent computing um, group in the world? Uh, one has to imagine the possibility and, and really go for it. it that, that, that truly is the, is the story. You have to have a strength of conviction, not only to convince your, your, your supervisors, your bosses to invest in you. You know, we built an acre of computer room just on the belief that we will need an it. An acre? An acre of computer room. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's an acre? Yes, it is. But now we have got more than an acre. When, the, when we first imagined the possibility, we built, we built a, an acre of computer room expecting the, the, and the, you know, the conviction wow. that we're going to be the leading facility in the world. Wow. Uh, we got to take a break here. <laughs> this is... Um, Evangelist Thomas <laughs> Zachariah, um, you you have no idea how much you are inspiring me right now with this conversation. We'll get the rest of it in just a moment. Coming up, we want to be the best because what we do matters. We are we at Oak Ridge National Laboratory are involved with some of the big challenging problems that humanity faces. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. My guest today is Thomas Zachariah. So this is, the, I told you I'm, I'm tripping really because something just hit me. As you were talking about, we have the fastest supercomputer in the world, period, preeminent. It's number one in the world. We have the fastest supercomputing and, um, capability in the world. Period. Period, yes. Period. Yes. All right. So when you were talking about putting together the team of people to make that happen, I fully expected we'd be talking about computers. Mm -hmm. But then in the middle of our conversation, it dawned on me that Moore's Law says basically every 18 months, That's correct. you've got to change because the learning has changed so rapidly. So it really doesn't matter what the computer is. It doesn't matter because a year, two years, five years down the road, 
the way technology is changing, chip design is changing, memory is changing, all of that stuff is changing, and they're doing some radical new things. The thing that stuck out in my mind was you actually have to have the intent to be the best as opposed to figuring out what the hardware solution to being the best is. It really is a software thing. It's the best people wrapped around a really big idea, and they'll figure out what that needs to be at the time it needs to be. Does that make sense at all? You, you, you encapsulated it. You have to have the intent to be the very best. One of the things that I say is that science is no different than football. You know, being the best matters. Why? Because being the best attracts the very best players, the very best scientists. And when the best players or the best scientists come to your institution, you remain the best. And why do you want to do that? In our case, we want to be the best because what we do matters. We are, we at Oak Ridge National Laboratory are involved with some of the big challenging problems that humanity faces, energy, environment. And, and, and I think that's something that, you know, it's great. You wake up in the morning and you have a sense of purpose in going to work. It's not a job. It really is a passion. Well, thank you for the, the vast contribution you've made by bringing people together to do big things. But now you're on to something big now. What, what's next for you? Well, I, uh, at the end of the month, uh, my wife and I will be leaving uh, for some time East Tennessee to, to Doha in Qatar in the Middle East. Uh, about six months ago, I was approached uh, to, to join Qatar Foundation to be their executive vice president for research. And initially, I thought, no, I'm, I'm having great fun in East Tennessee. I never thought that I would leave the place. They were persistent. And I had an opportunity to meet with uh, uh, both Her Highness Sheikh Amosa, and uh, who's a chairperson of Qatar Foundation and the president of uh, Qatar Foundation for Research. And they have a powerful idea. You know, the world is changing dramatically. There's going to be some substance, you know, systemic changes. In the next 10 years, there's going to be more people living in urban areas than rural areas for the first time. We have multimodal communication, transportation, and so our, the way we live and work is gonna change. And when I looked at Doha, it's a small country. It's a country of about 300,000 citizens and about a million expat population. Wow. Really? Just 300,000. They have the richest per capita income in the world. Their wealth comes from hydrocarbon, mostly natural gas. And they decided that in the 40, next 40 or 50 years, where they're guaranteed this very large uh, you know, hydrocarbon-based economy, they wanted to innovate. So they created Qatar Foundation 95 to enhance the human capacity, invest in research, in arts, culture. And so this is a umbrella organization and, and so they, they went and picked some of the very best schools to establish campuses there. So Georgetown University has a School of Foreign Service, Carnegie Mellon, Cornell, Virginia Commonwealth, Texas A&M, uh, you have HEC for Paris, uh, University College London for archaeology, and they're getting ready for Harvard to establish law school. And so now that they have the education piece established, they're be beginning to establish the research enterprise to transform the hydrocarbon economy into an innovation economy. And so they came and asked me, and I thought, one, it is an enriching experience. Secondly, I said, why not? Why not? <laughs> you know, it, it, it seemed like a, a good thing to do. It allows us to reset ourselves and, and imagine the possibility. And I think that I intend to fully intend to come back to East Tennessee. Our home is here. And so we, you know, I, I mentioned to you. Yeah, you, I, we had a very powerful conversation about that one question. I told you I'd tell you what that is. And that question was? That question was, where is home? You know, in, uh, we, we were born in, in India, the southern part of India. We've been all around the world. And, and, he, and we had to first and foremost ground ourselves. And we asked the question before we making the decision, where is home? And it's very clear what my wife and I said. East Tennessee is home. And once we settled that, the rest of everything was easy decision. So we're going to spend a few years uh, in, in Qatar, uh, and I think it's going to be exciting. And, you know, I mean, we'll get a chance to, in addition to work, we'll get a chance to visit the neighboring areas, 
you know, I've never been to the pyramids. It's very close by. I hear it's an hour distance away, northern Africa, eastern Europe, western Europe. So we, we hope to have a, in addition to work and, and contributing and learning, we also hope to do, take in some travel. But we definitely intend to come back to this community and be part of this community and to contribute once again to this community. Tell me about your children. I have two children, two wonderful children. Our oldest is uh, Nia. Uh, uh, she she's just finished uh, uh, her um, dentistry from UT Health Science Center. So she started her residency program in New York. She's in Brooklyn. And my son, who's was 24 years old, Sean, he finished his engineering from Georgia Tech. And as Indian parents, we would have liked to have, you know, he was admitted to, he is admitted to a, a business program in Harvard Business School, but he's deferred that. He's an entrepreneur, a venture-backed entrepreneur, so he's doing very well as well. So both of them are in the same city. We don't have, you know, they have a company with, for each other, even though they're about 40 minutes apart. And so we feel very comfortable leaving them in New York, and, and I'm sure that they will visit us in Doha, and we'll certainly come back here. It's like you have a couple of uh, children that say, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the blood. Before you get away, I always like to, I mean, such a rich interview, such a possibility-laden interview, uh, inspiring to have you on the show. I always ask people to teach me. What have you learned about possibility? And if you were sitting down and you were trying to coach me, for the next level of my life, you'd say, Halloran, remember this, focus on this, think about this. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think um, Halloran, uh, the life is full of possibilities. I mean, you, you know, I, I, when, when I came here to halfway around the world, this is not now, this is not a connected world. I had no idea what to expect, and I had $8 in my pocket. And where I lived, I, could, uh, I couldn't buy sweaters, because it was a warm, tropical country. And when I landed in New York in December, in early January, it was freezing cold, and all I had was a half sleeve sweater. And it's just because we didn't have sweaters there, didn't need sweaters there. And so when you, when you look at those kinds of, you know, when you have to pick up and go halfway around the world, you should just imagine the possibility. The world is a very rich place, and I know that already that uh, y you are somebody who is going to ask already asked why not because I think that's a great, great place to be. Thomas Zachariah, thanks for being on Anything is Possible. Thank you very much, Alan. We'll see you next time.